Greetings and welcome to the Global Center for Advanced Studies, GCAS Free Public Lecture Series 2020-2021. I am Asfar Hussein, Vice President of the Global Center for American Studies. And I, I welcome you all here today, tonight, or wherever you are in the world. I'll now introduce the moderator for our event, one whose work I've been following with a great deal of zeal for a long time, and one who is certainly one of my favorite philosophers working today. In fact, I can go on and on talking about the scale and scope, the range and richness and relevance of his work, but I'll have to be very brief given time constraints. A graduate from Yale University with a PhD in philosophy and the author of more than 14 books and hundreds of articles, one who is considered by many to be the intellectual successor to the great Caribbean theorist, activist, revolutionary, Franz Fanon. He is surely, in my opinion, a politically engaged philosopher, a committed philosopher, a philosopher committed to the cause of universal human emancipation. He's currently professor and head of the philosophy department at the University of Connecticut, Stalls. He succeeded our former GCAS president, the leading French philosopher, Alain Badiou, and is now the third honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies. And who is he? He is none other than Lewis Gordon. Welcome, Lewis. So, Professor Lewis Gordon. Thank you, Asfar. Thank you so much. And to, to everybody in the audience who has graciously joined us, I'd like to begin with saying shalom, assalamu alaikum, halito. It's very important we're in the United States of America and it's one of the indigenous languages here. Uh, it's chakta halito for hello, ujambo, swahili, hello. And in addition to that, as we know for so many as we're going through the uh, Jewish high holidays, Shana Tova. I am here right now in this position of honor to introduce Professor, Professor Noam Chomsky. One, the context of this meeting is the Global Center for Advanced Studies. And some of you, if you're not familiar with this organization, it's an organization dedicated not only to advancing new ideas, but also committed to debt-free education. Now, Professor Noam Chomsky uh, puts me at an advantage because to introduce him would be redundant since the audience already knows who he is. So instead of going through his many accolades, I'm going to introduce him through some brief remarks about not only why he's so precious to us, but also how his thought, his ideas make him the perfect person for a conversation as this one. The impact of Professor Chomsky's work crosses the entire sphere of the human sciences from linguistics psychology to philosophy, anthropology, politics, sociology, the full spectrum, including some areas that are not the human sciences, such as computational theory. He has authored more than 100 books, but saying somebody's written 100 books, psychoanalytically speaking, is just about quantity. But Professor Chomsky is the exemplification of quality. His books are influential not out of a hegemon, because Professor Chomsky has challenged a lot of hegemonic forces. His books are influential because of the ideas being generative. So these influential ideas are such that his books stand also among what we could call classics. His connection to GCAS is squarely rooted in my remark 
about the commitment of GCAS to education. And many of you know the world right now is such that there are people, particularly corporate forces, market fundamentalists, who actually are not interested in education. They prefer certification instead of education. But as I always remind my students and many audiences, there are a lot of certified idiots in the world. If we bring education and certification together, we bring together a magical force that could contribute to the flourishing of our species and life on this planet. Another aspect of Professor Chomsky is of course, he's on the, he was on Richard Nixon's enemies list. Now, the reason I see that as a badge of honor is because many of you know, I'm on the enemies list of all the right-wing groups. And there are some enemies who actually honor you through despising you. It's a statement about their ill judgment, but it also means you're actually saying something. And so there are additional elements in why Professor Chomsky and I stand before you right now. Professor Chomsky is currently at the University of Arizona. He is part-time lecturing there. He retired, he's Professor Emeritus from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Now, the name Noam, it means pleasantness from Hebrew. Uh, Professor Chomsky and I have something in common, uh, not only in terms of our work in philosophy, but we're also uh, Jewish men. He's from Ashkenazi Jewish communities. I'm from Mizrahi and Sephardic communities. And the striking thing about his name in Hebrew meaning pleasantness is as we know, Professor Chomsky has no reluctance to take on controversy, fire, etc. So his name, if we simply stick there, is a little misleading. His name, however, and his fame is such that he's almost become metonymic. If you were to look up the name Noam, Today, it says, see Noam Chomsky. So there's a certain point where he has become the embodiment of his name. But what many don't know about the name Noam, linked to the name Noah, linked to the name Noach, is that it also has East African origins. And in the language Medoneter, it means flowing water, flowing time. And it's no accident that the famous Noah, right? The person who built the ark is linked to water. I bring this up because Professor Chomsky's political convictions are all about freedom. And freedom should not be blocked. It should be let free to flow. So I prefer the East African interpretation of his name. Without further ado, the title of Professor Chomsky's talk is The Most Remarkable Moment in History. That said, I now yield the floor to Professor Noam Chomsky. We are indeed living at a remarkable moment, a moment that is in fact unique in human history. It's a moment of confluence, of crises, of extraordinary severity with the fate of the human experiment literally at stake. The issues are coming to a head in the next few weeks in the most powerful state in history, a state that dominates the world and under the current leadership has not only broken sharply with norms of civilized behavior, but quite literally threatens the survival of organized human society. The evidence is there before our eyes almost daily. Uh, President Trump's wrecking ball has demolished one international agreement after another. <laughs> 
while his administration asserts its right to do as it wishes, whatever the world may want or need. A few weeks ago, the Trump administration withdrew from COVAX. COVAX is the global consortium seeking to develop, manufacture, and equitably distribute a coronavirus vaccine. The effects are severe. International cooperation, of course, expedites the development of a vaccine. Go it alone impedes it. The COVAX consortium was considering ways to ensure that eventual vaccines will reach people who need them. The poor in Africa, for example, not only those who can monopolize it for themselves, but Trump is declaring once again, America first and probably alone. The fate of the world is not his concern nor is concern, nor is his concern the fate of Americans who he has harmed severely. America first translates as me first. Pulling out of COVAX is just another blow to Americans as well. What is important, all of this hails into insignificance for Trump in comparison to implement his electoral prospects by firing up his rabid popular base. A few days after the COVAX withdrawal, Trump approached the United Nations Security Council demanding that UN sanctions on Iran be reinstituted. The Iran nuclear agreements were another target of the Trump wrecking ball. They were established by President Obama, so had to be destroyed over the objections of all of the signers. The Security Council refused Trump's demand almost unanimously including all US allies. A few days later, Secretary of State Pompeo, with supreme arrogance, informed the Security Council that the sanctions are reinstated because we say so, and that any violators will be severely punished which is not an empty threat. These are only the current moves. We've been watching this for four years. Not surprisingly, the rest of the world is concerned, if not appalled. It would be difficult to find a more sober and respected commentator than Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times. He writes that the world is facing a serious crisis. And if Trump is reelected, in his words, this will be terminal. Those are strong words, rarely used. And Wolf was not even referring to the major crises that humanity faces. Wolf was referring to the global order, which is a critical matter, but it's not on the scale of the vastly more serious crises, crises with terrible consequences. These are the crises that are driving the hands of the famous doomsday clock towards midnight. Midnight means termination.
Wolf's concept terminal is not a new entry into public discourse. We have been living under its shadow for 75 years, ever since we learned that human intelligence has devised the means that would soon lead the capacity for terminal destruction. That realization was shattering enough, but there was more. It was not then understood that humanity was ending and entering a new geological epoch called the Anthropocene, an epoch in which human activities are despoiling the environment in a manner that is now also moving towards terminal disaster. The hands of the doomsday clock were first set shortly after atom bombs were dropped. The minute hand has oscillated since then as global circumstances have changed. Every year that Trump has been in office, the hand has been moved closer to midnight. Two years ago, it reached the closest it has ever been. Last January, the analysts abandoned minutes. They turned to seconds, a hundred seconds to midnight. The reasons were the ones they have mentioned before. The growing threat of nuclear war, the growing threat of environmental catastrophe, and the deterioration of democracy. That third element might seem out of place, but it's not. Declining democracy is a fitting member of this grim trio. The reason is that the only hope for escaping the two threats of termination is a vibrant democracy in which concerned, informed citizens are fully engaged in deliberation, policy formation, and direct action. That was last January. Since then, President Trump has amplified all three of the threats. He has continued his demolition of the arms control regime that has offered some protection against the threat of nuclear war. He has also been pursuing the development of new and even more dangerous weapons, encouraging a race towards midnight. That's the first threat. Second, he has opened up vast new air areas for oil drilling. Meanwhile, staffing the executive with representatives of the business world who are systematically de dismantling the regulatory system that somewhat mitigates the effect the destructive effect of fossil fuel use, and that protects the population from toxic chemicals and from pollution. Pollution is a curse that is now doubly murderous in the course of a severe respiratory epidemic. Their latest step, just two days ago, was to rescind the decision of government scientists to ban chemicals responsible for brain damage to children. You can make more profit, who cares? Tomorrow, there will be another crime 
in the service of profit for the rich and the powerful and for the personal ambitions of the sociopath who's in charge. Trump has also carried forward his campaign to undermine democracy. He has purged the executive branch of the government of any independent voice. Uh, Congress had long ago established inspectors to monitor the performance of the executive branch. They began to look into the swamp of corruption that Trump has created in Washington. He took care of that quickly by simply firing them. He even went out of his way to insult the senior Republican senator who had spent most of his career establishing this system to try to prevent malfeasance and corruption. There was scarcely a word from the Republican Senate, firmly in Trump's pocket, hardly a shred of integrity remaining, terrified by the popular base that Trump has mobilized. This onslaught against democracy is only the bare beginning. Trump's latest step is to warn that he may not leave office if he is not satisfied with the outcome of the election in November. That threat is taken very seriously in high places. To mention just a few examples, two highly respected retired military commanders released an open letter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, highest military official in the country. They reviewed for him his constitutional responsibility to send the army to remove by force a lawless president, that's their phrase referring to Trump, to remove a lawless president who refuses to leave office after his electoral defeat. The Pentagon is not ignoring these concerns, much to the distress of senior military officers. Several generals have even announced that they'll resign if Trump proceeds to try to order them into action. Nothing like this was ever thinkable in the past. The concerns reached to the level of the highest scholarship. One of the world's leading scholars of the fascist monstrosity, Yale, Yale University professor Timothy Snyder has been warning of incipient fascism under Trump for several years. Right now, a few days ago, he compared the current moment in America to the early 1930s in Germany. He warned that the Reichstag is burning. He was referring to the event, the Reichstag fire, the event that served as the pretext for Hitler to assume absolute power. Viewing Trump's recent performance, Snyder now concludes that the Reichstag has been on a slow burn since June. We're approaching the moment comparable to Hitler's assumption of absolute power. Not usual words. Many establishment figures also regard the warnings as realistic. 
one of them is a high level transition project which has just reported the results of the war gaming it has been conducting on possible outcomes of the November election. The project members are, I'm quoting the project, the project members are some of the most accomplished Republicans, Democrats, civil servants, media experts, pollsters, and strategists, prominent figures from both parties. Under any scenario, apart from a clear Trump victory, the war games lead to something like civil war with Trump choosing to end the American experiment, their phrase, choosing to end the American experiment. Again, these are strong words never heard before from sober mainstream voices. The very fact that such words are, are heard is ominous enough. They are not alone. And given incomparable US power, far more than the American experiment is at risk. Nothing like this has happened in the often troubled history of parliamentary democracy. Just keeping to Richard, recent years, uh, Richard Nixon is not the most delightful person in presidential history. Uh, Richard Nixon had good reason to believe that he had won the 1960 election that he had been deprived of victory because of criminal manipulation of votes by Democratic Party operatives. He did not contest the results. He put the welfare of the country above his personal ambition. Al Gore did the same 20 years later, not today. The service to the rich of the Trump Republican Party is quite remarkable, even by the neoliberal standards of exaltation of greed. But it is important to remember that they are only carrying to an extreme, an outlandish extreme, the neoliberal project of the past 40 years. One of the most prestigious research institutions, the Rand Corporation, recently sought to estimate the scale of the gifts that the general population has lavished on the super rich and the corporate sector during the 40 years of neoliberalism. Their conclusion, $47 trillion. Over a trillion dollars a year has been transferred from the lower 90%, the working class, the middle class, transferred to the top income uh, earners over a trillion dollars a year. They're not spread among the top 10%. Overwhelmingly, they go to the top tier among the top 10%, the super rich. When President Reagan came into office 40 years ago, initiating the neoliberal assault, the top 0.1% of the population owned 10% of the wealth. In the past 40 years, that has doubled. They now have 20% of wealth. Uh, 
shocking figure. One illustration of how it works is provided by the leading specialists on tax policy to famous economists. They show that in 2018, following the tax robbery, that was the one legislative Trump achievement. I'm now quoting them. For the first time in the last hundred years, billionaires have paid less in taxes than steel workers, school teachers, and retirees. That erases a century of fiscal history. In 2018, for the first time in the modern history of the United States, capital has been taxed less than labor. That's a truly impressive victory of class war. It's called liberty in the reigning doctrines. It's worth taking a moment to review briefly the economic history of the United States since World War II with major effects elsewhere. There have been two clearly distinct periods. The break between them is roughly 40 years ago. The first is the period of what is called regimented capitalism. That was from the end of the war into the 1970s. During that period, capitalism was carefully regulated by the government. That's the first period. The second period is the neoliberal era that took off under Reagan in the United States, Thatcher in England, others following. The first period, period of regimented capitalism, is called by economists the golden age of American capitalism. Should really be called state capitalism. Growth was unusually high, breaking records, and it was egalitarian growth. The lowest part of the population raised income as much as the highest part. Wages closely tracked productivity. F financial institutions were very limited, tightly controlled, no, cri no financial crises. The neoliberal reaction reversed all of that. Economic and productivity growth continued, but more slowly and the wealth that was produced flowed into very few pockets. Uh, wages were decoupled, separated from productivity, and they flattened. The trillion dollars a year transferred from working people and the middle class to the super rich is only part of the story. In addition to that, tens of trillions of dollars are stolen from the public by pouring capital into tax havens. Since Ronald Reagan authorized these practices, previously they had been banned and the laws were enforced. Financial institutions exploded in scale. They became the dominant part of the economy, quote, contributing nothing to it, but causing regular crises, thanks to the predatory practices that were authorized by neoliberal deregulation, followed by taxpayer bailouts for the per perpetrators, which are in fact only a part of the massive subsidy that financial institutions receive. Reagan and Thatcher moved at once to destroy 
labor unions. Both of them recognized that unions are the primary means of defense for working people against concentrated capital. And here there's something that we should remember because it has great significance for the future. Reagan and Thatcher were not opening a new chapter in neoliberalism. They were adopting the leading principles of neoliberalism from its earliest days in Vienna between the two world wars, 1920s. In Vienna, the founder, patron saint of the neoliberal movement, Ludwig von Mises, was overjoyed when the near fascist government violently destroyed Austria's vibrant social democracy and the unions that were interfering with what is called sound economics by defending the rights of working people. Mises explained his thinking in his uh, neoliberal classic called neoliberalism, 1927, five years after Mussolini had initiated his brutal rule. I'll quote from what he said about fascism in 1927. It cannot be denied that fascism and similar movements aimed at the establishment of dictatorships are full of the best intentions and that their intervention has for the moment saved European civilization. The merit that fascism has thereby won for itself will live on eternally in history, though it will only be temporary, he assured us. Uh, the black shirts will go home after having accomplished their good work of destroying unions and social democracy, just as we saw. The very same principles inspired enthusiastic neoliberal support for the hideous Pinochet dictatorship in Chile. A few years later, they were put into operation in a different form in the global arena under the leadership of the United States and Britain. These lessons of the past century should not be hidden away. One of the most striking and consistent lessons is that neoliberalism with its call for liberty is perfectly compatible with harsh repression and violence by the powerful state. We should bear that in mind as we move into a new post pandemic era something I'll return to in a moment. Going back to the doomsday clock, it was set last January. That was before the scale of the pandemic was understood. Humanity will sooner or later recover from the pandemic at terrible cost, at needless cost. We see that very clearly from the experiences that took decisive action. As soon as China provided the world with all of the relevant information about the virus on January the 10th. Primary among them were the countries of East and Southeast Asia. Uh, and Oceania, New Zealand, Australia, and also 
remarkably Africa, where the countries took quick and effective action and controlled the pandemic. Others followed along too late, bringing up the rear are a few utter disasters. The first is the United States. The second is Bolsonaro's Brazil. The third is Modi's India. The three major leaders in the current project of dismantling parliamentary democracy are the United States, Bolsonaro's Brazil, and Modi's India. Also the leaders far ahead of others in cases and deaths from pandemics. It's a correlation that one might want to think about. Well, despite the malfeasance or indifference of some political leaders, there will ultimately be some kind of recovery from the pandemic. We will not, however, recover from the melting of the polar ice caps. That's permanent. We will not recover from the exploding rates, rate of fires in the Arctic region that are releasing enormous amount, amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere or other steps on our march to catastrophe. Right now, the most prominent climate scientists are warning us to panic now, their words. They are not being alarmist. There is no time to waste. Most countries are doing something, not enough, but at least something. But the world is cursed by leaders who are not only refusing to take action, but are deliberately accelerating the race to disaster. The malignancy in the US presidency is far in the lead in this monstrous criminality. It's not only governments, the same is true of fossil fuel industries, the big banks that finance them, other industries that profit from actions that put the survival of humanity at serious risk. I'm actually quoting that phrase from a leaked internal memo of America's largest bank. They know what they're doing. They're putting the survival of humanity at risk for profit and power in the short term. Uh, humanity will not long survive this institutional malignancy. It's important to recognize that the means to manage the crisis are available, feasible, available, but not forever. One primary task that all of us face is to ensure that we panic now and act accordingly. The crises that we face in this unique moment of human history are all international. Environmental catastrophe, nuclear war, the pandemic have no borders. And in a less transparent way, the same is true of the third of the demons that stalk the earth and drive the second hand of the doomsday clock toward midnight, the deterioration of democracy. The international character of this plague becomes evident when we examine its origins. Worth thinking about that.
circumstances vary, but there are some common roots. Much of the malignancy traces back to the neoliberal assault on the world's population launched in force 40 years ago. The basic character of the assault was captured in the opening pronouncements of the most prominent figures. Ronald Reagan, in his inaugural address, declared that government is the problem, not the solution. Well, what does that mean? It means that decisions have to be removed from government, which is at least partially under public control. They have to be removed to private power, which is totally unaccountable to the public. Furthermore, the sole responsibility of private business power is self enrichment. That's what we were informed by the chief economist of the movement 40 years ago, Milton Friedman. Well, I've reviewed some of the consequences deeply rooted in the doctrines that were announced and implemented. They were barely perceived at the time, just as the neoliberal assault was beginning to take shape. The president of the United Auto Workers, major union, Doug Fraser, he resigned from a labor management committee. He expressed his shock in his words that business leaders have chosen to wage a one-sided class war in this country, a war against working people, against the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young, the very old, and even many in the middle class of our society. They have broken and discarded the fragile, unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress, during the period of regimented capitalism. His recognition of how the world works was somewhat belated, in fact, too late to fend off the bitter class war launched by business leaders who were granted free reign by compliant governments. Now, the consequences over the world are not very surprising. Widespread anger, resentment, contempt for political institutions. All of this provides fertile territory for demagogues who can pretend to be your savior while they're stabbing you in the back. Meanwhile, deflecting the blame for the blame for what they're doing to you, deflecting it to scapegoats, uh, immigrants, uh, blacks, uh, China, whoever fits longstanding prejudices. Well, returning to the major crises we face at this historic moment, all are international and two internationals are being formed to confront them. One of them is the progressive international. It had its opening session last weekend in Iceland where the prime minister is a member of the governing board. The international is an outgrowth of the highly successful Bernie Sanders movement in the United States and a European counterpart called DM25 was founded by Yanis Varoufakis. It's a transnational European organization seeking to protect what is valuable 
in the European Union while overcoming the very serious flaws that are now endangering its survival. The International brings together prominent voices from the global south. It's an initiative with great promise, I believe. That is one international. The second one is unnamed. It has been taking shape under the leadership of the Trump presidency. It's a reactionary international comprising the world's most reactionary states. In the Western Hemisphere, its main member is Bolsonaro's Brazil. In the Middle East, prime members are the family dictatorships of the Gulf, the Egyptian dictatorship of al-Sisi, the worst in Egypt's bitter history, and Israel, which long ago discarded its social democratic origins and shifted far to the right. That's the predicted effect of the long and brutal occupation. The current agreements between Israel and the Arab dictatorships, which formalize long-standing tacit relations, they are a significant step towards solidifying the Middle East base of the reactionary international. The Palestinians are kicked in the face. That's the proper fate of those who lack power and do not grovel properly at the feet of the natural masters. To the east, the main candidate is India, where Prime Minister Modi is destroying India's secular democracy, turning the country into a racist Hindu nationalist state while crushing Kashmir. The European contingent includes Orban's so-called illiberal democracy, ending democracy in Hungary. It also includes such rising stars as Italy's Mario Salvini, who seems to particularly enjoy the spectacle, spectacle of refugees, miserable refugees, drowning in the Mediterranean, fleeing from the wreckage of centuries of European terror and violence, including Italy, and similar elements elsewhere. The reactionary international also has powerful backing in the dominant global economic institutions. Well, these two internationals comprise a good part of the world. One of them at the level of states, the other popular movements. Each is a prominent representative of much broader social forces, which have contending images of the world that should emerge from the current pandemic. One force is working relentlessly to construct a harsher version of the neoliberal global system from which they have greatly profited with more intensive surveillance and control carrying forward the neoliberal alliance of rule by the very rich and state power to ensure compliance. The contending force headed by, symbolized by the progressive international looks forward to a world of justice and peace with energies and resources directed to serving human needs rather than the demands of a tiny minority. It's a kind of class struggle 
on a global scale with many complex facets and interactions. And it is no exaggeration to say that the fate of the human experiment depends on the outcome of this struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Before I make my remarks, our vice, our honorary vice president, as far as saying, would like to say something on the behalf of Bangladesh. Well, again, Asfar Hussain, Vice President of the Global Center for Advanced Studies here. Onik, Onik, Dhanavad, Odhapak Chomsky, Iti Hasher, a Pishon, Ullek Jogo, Muhutteru, Apnari Darun, Bokri Darchun, Apna Kotha, Ukaj, Shakol, Dharunir, Nipidone, Virute, Amade, Shangram, and Jono Prashungik, Hue, take it up. That was for Professor Chomsky in my mother tongue, Bengali as the Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore once said something to this effect, one can probably best express one's heartfelt reactions and gratitude in one's mother tongue. Let me now translate very quickly what I said into English now. Thanks much, Professor Chomsky, for your remarkable lecture on the remarkable moment in our history, your words and your works continue to remain and resonate with our struggles against all forms and forces of oppression around the world. Well, I'll be very brief here, as brief as possible. So very quickly, a few words about my own relationship with Noam Chomsky and his work. I come from Bangladesh, a peripheral formation devastated by its ruling classes, by neoliberal assaults in a great variety of ways by global capitalism, that is, a country where I grew up reading Chomsky in my early 20s and even writing about his work in the areas of both linguistics and politics in a left Bengali views weekly, I co-edited back in the early 90s. In fact, I was introduced to Chomsky's work by a high school teacher living in an obscure village in a peripheral third world country like Bangladesh. And that tells you how far Chomsky can go in an obscure village in a peripheral third world country like Bangladesh. In fact, that high school teacher even wrote a short verse about Chomsky, something that I wanted to share with you all here. I should point out emphatically that in Bangladesh, in a variety of oppositional progressive circles, Chomsky and his work are deeply valued and respected to say the least, while of course his work has been translated into Bengali in Bangladesh, as well as in West Bengal, India, and a number of my colleagues and comrades and friends and former students from both Bangladesh and India are with us now online for this event today. And many of them have wanted me to convey to you, Professor Chomsky, their solidarity and their gratitude and love for the work you have been doing for decades and for relentlessly speaking the truth to power, exemplifying your critical role as an uncompromising and to use your own friend, Edward Said's words, unafraid and compassionate intellectual. Surely you are more than one of the makers of the 20th century. Last, on a very quick and a more personal note, bear with me a little, please. I vividly recall with deepest gratitude and most fondly cherish my first encounter with you in person when I met you and talked to you at Washington State University back in 2005. It was quite an experience, as it was quite an experience receiving even a note of support from you, one that we did not expect after we had sent you a copy of the of our activist journal called Discontent that we used to bring out as graduate students in the late 90s. There is no such thing as stellar distance as far as Professor Chomsky is concerned. Can thank you enough, Professor Chomsky, 
and on behalf of my colleagues and friends from Bangladesh and India, I also thank Professor Lewis Gordon and Kristen Davis for making this great event happen in the GCAS public lecture series. Thank you all. Thank you, Aspar Hussain. Um, um, an additional point, although I uh, mentioned in that um, it's a Jewish high holidays, uh, I also would like to say something to uh, basically to many of our people in South Asia. Uh, some of you, as far already knows, that part of my background is Tamil. So I'll say Machia Varakam to my brothers and sisters, particularly from Pondicherry, Kerala, and all over the globe, and also related to Professor Chomsky's talk, of course, the Dalits. Because a lot of people don't understand the extent to which the intellectual uh, energy, the struggles, the ongoing way to fight these issues has been long-term and continues among the Dalits in South Asia. Okay. And, and for many of the African-Americans, many Black Brazilians, <coughs> bear in mind that another name for Dalits is the Black Untouchables of South Asia. Thank you, Professor Chomsky, for your talk. I'd like to add that there's a tendency when people, when critics, when commentators talk about Professor Chomsky to separate his theoretical work from his political work. But I actually don't read him in that way. Excuse me, <coughs> I'm still recovering from an illness. The thing is, his theoretical work pulls the rug from under the conceptions of how to understand our species that actually supports the forces at work today. And you may ask, what do I mean? Well, almost anybody who will speak with young people today about our plight will inevitably hear the word human nature. But when they think of human nature, it's often guided by an ideological framework from the early, from early European modernity 15th and 16th century that took the form of the notion of a tabula rasa, of an empty slate, empty mind. And the idea from that perspective then sets the room for what becomes a way of looking at the, at the human being outside of the human being's relationship to other human beings. This set the framework for the self-interested subject that enabled the ideological presentation from markets, because we should remember humanity has always had markets, to something idolatrous, which is the market. And one of the things about idols is that the market functions like a god for these people to whom, as we've even seen back in spring, their supporters were asking many to sacrifice ourselves to the market. The market becomes like the god to gobble up everything and everyone. And within that framework, we have to imagine in the United States, while they were making this plea in March and April to May, there were 700 to 1,000 people dying a week. As of the presentation of Professor Chomsky's talk today, we exceed that number per day. So we're living in an environment 
in which there is a catastrophic level of irresponsibility by a corrupt and a fascist ruling elite. Now, Professor Chomsky's identified, he used the term international to talk about the converging pandemics, if we will. We know that COVID, that the novel coronavirus respects no borders. It has no boundaries. Our masks, in fact, individually protect us. But he reminds us of nuclear threat, climate threat, and he's absolutely correct. Make no mistake about it. We're living in a period of a concerted war against democracy. And it's important to bear that in mind because the enemy of fascism has always been the critical force of the people, truth, and ultimately something that it's difficult to to say it, but we should say it plainly. It's also a war on excellence. And what I mean by that is that humanity has taken seriously the importance of education. And that is one of the first things that fascists go after. Humanity has understood the importance of education because ultimately we are a fragile species and the only thing that has enabled us ultimately to go from a near extinct species to eight billion strong was intelligence. Now in the midst of all that, this means that we need to take seriously our global reality. Right now, for instance, we are here in a, an environment in which we must be physically distant. But the technological resources and the power of something Professor Chomsky has written a lot on, which is language and our ability to communicate means humanity lives on a very small planet. Physical distance doesn't have to require social distance. But the reality of the ruling elite is that they would like us both to be physically distant and socially distant. Because if we're socially distant, we cannot communicate to develop the proper critical response to their machinations. And so humanity is suffering from this consequence of mediocre leadership, because make no mistake about it, this is the rule of little men and little women, but predominantly little men. These are people who are resentful of the fact that they cannot rise to the occasion. And so they have war, waged a war on anybody who could extend the ethical face and creativity of our species. And this has because of a consequence of people who fetishize the market because from their conception of the human being, from their conception of the world, there's only one thing to ask, what is in it for me? And if one is so self-centered, then one is not even interested in the plight of generations to come, or for those who are not in sight, out of sight, out of mind. And so within that framework, when we take seriously what it is to fight for democracy, we need to understand that democracy is ultimately never about me. It's always ultimately the political question of those whom I will never meet and I may never know. The radical intellectual, the radical community, the community who have taken to the streets have understood 
very clearly that the struggle for the integrity of life is to fight for those who are not you, may never ever be like you, but whose right to live, whose dignity, whose freedom should be celebrated. And so I thank Professor Chomsky for reminding us that this very crucial, very exigent moment involves a struggle for democracy as a struggle for life itself. And so we come then to some of the questions because I know our viewers are sending in questions and I'll just pose some brief considerations to kick things off. The first one is of course, fascism is part of this discussion. But you know, fascism has very interesting layers of orientation. For Dalits, whom I mentioned earlier, for indigenous peoples in, North, in, in Abayala and in North America, for indigenous peoples across the world, and for black peoples in the United States. The truth is we've been dealing with 500 years of structural racist fascism. Fascism is a racism, but it seems to give those who benefit from it, at least temporarily, the illusion of, of the idea that ultimately what is done to the people on whose neck they place their knee is legitimate. However, as Amy Cezier said, when he looked at World War II, he said he regarded Europe as facing Hitlerism as simply its own values turned on itself. Today, we're witnessing the expansion of fascism to the very groups who think it cannot happen to me. It is okay as long as it's done against the proverbial them. And so what we see here then is the expansion of fascism in terms of the goal it has always had, which is the elimination of the distribution of power as manifested in the people's ability to govern themselves. Fascism ultimately is also a war against political life. And so the reality we're facing right now is one in which, as Professor Chomsky points out, that we are dealing with anti-democracy. But of course, the question, I'm curious for Professor Chomsky to reflect on, which I'm sure many are asking, which is a lot of literature tries to say today, a lot of journalists that we're going toward fascism. But it has struck me that the solidification of fascism in the United States was, had occurred in January in the senatorial trials. With that moment, it was demonstrated that we are not only in the hands of fascists such as Mitch McConnell, but it also meant that the bullying that fascism exemplifies is such that the mediocrity of leadership and the cowardice that's there among certain sectors who are in control in the Senate stood to the side, or rather stepped back and made a clear lawless individual now run rampant. So the question is, are we toward fascism or would you agree that we're actually in it? The second one is connected to the first because we see the Trump valorization of monuments and all of this and the Confederate monuments. But what we know is all fascisms try to promise the people eternity. That's why monuments love stones. That's why there's such an obsession with these ugly, gravestones because monuments are graves. But the right has always been obsessed with permanence under the guise of law and order. And as we see this assertion of permanence, 
it was very striking in Professor Chomsky's talk that he brought out the language of the eternal. Now, what Professor Chomsky and many of us in the audience know is that we're human beings, we're not gods. We delude ourselves. In fact, we commit hubris, idolatry, to us beat our chests with the notion of the eternal. And the problem with those who seek the eternal is not only their malignant narcissism, but they, they require few of them to disrupt the ongoing life, living practice of the cultivation of freedom. And then the last part is absolutely true about from the Reagan administration and the fact that 47 trillion that have gone to the rich. But we know that, and it was correct to point to Milton Friedman and a lot of those other forces that have taken this absurd position that any translation of power into the form of the public is somehow totalitarian. What we are struggling with is a pr profound hatred of the public, a profound privatization of power, which means that we're also dealing with the issue of disempowerment at a time in which our species has within its domain the custodianship at least of the current configuration of life on the planet. And a lot of this it comes to a head and more, I would argue, than class struggle. I would argue it's not even class warfare. The goal of the current global elites, whether it's in Saudi Arabia, whether it is going to be Modi, whether it's Bolsonaro's, all the way through to Putin in Russia, all the way through to what we're seeing with Barr, McConnell, and Trump, their goal is no longer class warfare. Their goal is class massacre. So we will go to the audience, but I'd like Professor Chomsky to just add some additional remarks and I'll read the questions posed to him. Thank you. Well, you brought up a lot of very significant points. They could easily take many hours of discussion and deserve it. Uh, I don't want to take time away from the questions. So just a few very brief comments on several points that you made. The idea that we've been through 500 years of destruction and massacre is beyond any question. Uh, whether we want to call it fascism or something else, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I would prefer to keep the term fascism to a more technical use, not just the use of monstrosity and savagery, but that's a terminological point. In fact, the, the good symbol of what has happened over the past 50 years, 500 years, is uh, close to 500 years, is uh, Bangladesh and Haiti, the two very striking places. These were the richest places in the world when the Europeans reached them. Uh, the British explorers who, Clive and others who made it to Dhaka couldn't believe the wealth and richness and, uh, of the country they were reaching. Uh, Haiti was the richest colony in the world. Uh, peaceful, rich resources, uh, about maybe 20% of France's wealth comes from robbing Haiti. So here we have the, maybe the two richest places in the world when the Europeans arrived. They are now the virtual symbols of despair and disaster. Can we learn something from that? Well, in fact, that's symbolic of what happened all over the world. Uh, no time to go through the details. I'll just mention one simple point. 
there's a lot of concern in the United States about what are called endless wars. We have to get out of these endless wars like Afghanistan. How can we be mired in endless wars? The history of the United States from its origins, 1783, is endless wars. The United States is one of the rare countries in the world that has almost has been at war almost every year since its founding. Now we don't call those wars, but the founding fathers did. They called them wars of extermination against the Indian nations. One of the main reasons for the American Revolution was that King George III of England had issued a royal proclamation in uh, 1763, decade before the revolution, a royal proclamation that barred the colonists, the colonists from moving into Indian territory. There's a range of mountains in the east of the United States, Appalachian mountains. Settlers were not permitted to go beyond there. They weren't accepting that. They wanted to move to the West, to the rich lands of the West, the lands of the Indian nations. And as soon as the British were expelled, it's exactly what they did. The wars began against the Indian nations, wars of aggression, destruction, uh, violation of treaties, and outright extermination. Their word, not mine. They went through the entire 19th century, also conquering half of Mexico, where I am sitting right now, is occupied Mexico, conquered in a war of aggression. Uh, then we get into the late 19th century, 20th century, uh, interventions, violence, uh, terror, I don't have to go through it, uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, and so on. So yes, that's the history. Europe, in many ways, is much worse. Europe was, people think today of nation states as somehow a natural formation, anything but uh, Europe was the most violent place in the world for centuries while Europeans were slaughtering each other, uh, trying to decide where the boundary of their power would be, uh, here or a little bit further to the east or west, continued right until the mid 20th century. Now, the only reason it stopped is that everyone realized that the next time they play the game of slaughtering each other, everything will be done. Human intelligence has just reached the point where the next step is total destruction. So we better somehow try to find to live at peace. Well, Europe was becoming the most violent place in the world. It was also changing the nature of war. As military historians have pointed out, Europe turned war from an activity to a science. The means of destruction, the culture of destruction, the culture of savagery reached new heights. So when the Europeans started to invade the rest of the world, they basically conquered and destroyed it. The war was just a different activity for Europeans they developed their skills through and their culture of savagery through hundreds of years of experience within Europe. So that's a large part of the modern age. You're quite right. As to the class struggle and the class massacre, we're moving towards something even worse. We're moving towards destruction of organized human society. Nobody's going to escape. As the sea level rises, the plains of Bangladesh will be flooded as they were under the recent cyclone. 
will get much worse. Tens, hundreds of millions of people will have to flee. South Asia may become unlivable. The temperatures are already reaching the point where you can barely survive them without air conditioning, which most people don't have. Their water is being eliminated. Uh, hundreds of millions of people in India already don't have water. As the glaciers melt and the rivers dry, two nuclear armed states are going to be facing the question, who gets the remaining water? Uh, we don't have to guess where that's going to lead. Similar th things are happening almost everywhere. Where I live in Arizona, it is a desert, but a livable desert. It's going to be an unlivable desert in not too many years, by the end of the century. That's happening everywhere. We are racing towards disaster. The other hideous terror, nuclear weapons, anyone who looks at the record knows that it's a virtual miracle that we've survived these 75, 75 years. The arms control regime, which began about 60 years ago, has been a help in reducing the danger. It's now gone. Trump has eliminated it. He said, let's race to further weapons, more disastrous, more destructive. An arms race that'll kill us all. We can stop all this. We can stop all of it but not by sitting back quietly. It's going to have to be, as you said, constant activism out in the streets, in the political chambers, educating, changing consciousness, changing awareness, a huge task, and there isn't much time, but we have to undertake it. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. One of the things that some of us, one of the ways in which people fail to see what can be done is because there's so much of an assault that too many people want to look at the top of the mountain instead of the steps to get there. And one of the things that many of us try to remind our communities of is that no one person can do everything, but everybody should do something. And I hope that many of you are listening to this conversation understand that each of us has our part to do. Political action is necessary and it does make a difference. I'm going to read some of the, read the questions and you could just respond to any you would like. Uh, that way, I, I prefer to read them out. That way, at least they're on the table so people will know what the community is asked. Sometimes at least having that reflection, even if we don't get to answer them, is important for the conversation to do what we want it and hope it will do, which is to transcend the immediate one we're having now. So I'll just read them in the order as they appeared. Uh, the first two are of the same, are basically asking the same question. One is from Moino from Bangladesh. And the other person did not put the name, but they basically said, good to hear Chomsky. What do you think about Zionism and Trump? Are they connected? And the other one, about Zionism. Connected. Yeah. And the other one, they're connected. One of them, the first one is asking about Zionism and Trump. And the other one is, please, uh, is what is the opinion of Chomsky about Zionism and does he think Donald Trump is connected with his Zionism and Israeli agenda? That's the first. The next is from Sizori. If Donald Trump continues in power, how will it affect the democracy of Central democracies of Central and South America? And that's that's from Muriel Martinez from Colombia. Another question, and again, I just want to make sure a lot of the viewers get to hear the questions. The next one from Alberto Pacheco. In such a precarious and depoliticized in society molded by neoliberalism, 
is it still valid to configure the strategies of resistance to power from the liberal political system? The next one, the person's name isn't there, but oh, it's the continuation. Or is this, or these time, or this time, should this lead to focus on micropolitics and the rise of molecular revolutionary strategies focused on subjectivity and on this cognitive phase of capitalism? And there are two more from Marta Jimenez. Where do we go? Where do we get energy? Where do we get energy to keep resisting while things get worse? More concretely, where does Professor Chomsky get his motivation? What strategies to persist can we learn from his admirable experience? And uh, we have two more from Omer Yildiz, referring to Marta Jimenez's question. I also want to ask a simple question. Is there any hope? If so, what is it? And then finally, oh, and then, thank you, Professor Chomsky, for your overwhelming lecture. I would like to take the opportunity to tell you that I started reading you when I was 18 years old. So basically grew up in your, oh, that's more a comment. Oh, the question is, what do you think of, Thoreau, of Thoreau's claim that the marginal benefit of human productivity and is unmeasurable because, and I'm not sure exactly what the because refers to. Uh, it says, does Professor Chomsky have any thoughts on the Egyptian Ethiopian water war? And that's from Mona Gamil in Cairo. Those are a lot, so I'll stop there. Were you able to hear all of those? Except the last one. The last one was the one about Thoreau. I didn't hear what what yeah, was it, Thoreau. The the one. Let me see if I could find it. Next to last. Yeah. So, what do you think of Thoreau? It was spelled here with T H U R O W. Thoreau's claim that the marginal benefit of human productivity is unmeasurable. And the last one is: Do you have any thoughts on the Egyptian Ethiopian water war? Oh. Okay. okay, a few comments. Good questions. Every one of them could take a long time. So start with the first. Uh, President Trump himself uh, probably doesn't know where Israel and Palestine are. Doesn't compare about, doesn't care about them. But he does know about his voting base. That's what he cares about. The United States is a deeply religious country, very unusual in the Western world. It's not a secular country. Uh, probably uh, two thirds of the population expects uh, the second coming of Jesus, maybe half in their lifetimes. Uh, the vice president, Hence, an evangelical Christian uh, apparently believes that the world was created a couple of thousand years ago, exactly the way it is. Uh, Pompeo, Secretary of State, evangelical Christian, uh, has already told us that he thinks uh, God sent Trump to Earth to save Israel from Iran. Okay, that's the leadership. Uh, the voting, maybe 25% of the population is evangelical Christians. Uh, they're totally in Trump's pocket, not because he believes a word they do, but because he gives them gifts. Just as he gives gifts to the corporate sector, he ensures that the uh, evangelical population will get their way on abortion, on uh, allowing pastors to talk give political talks in churches and so on. So he throws them some gifts, the uh, corporate sector doesn't mind, so they say, fine, you want to do it, okay. The evangelicals have a very interesting relation to Israel. Uh, they are passionately in favor of Israeli policies of ex expansion, destruction of Palestinians, violence, and so on. 
And the reason is they're extreme anti-Semites. It combines. You have to understand the doctrines. The doctrine is that uh, this, of course, not all evangelicals, just a leading sector of them. The doctrine is that there'll be a, a huge conflict in Armageddon. Uh, everything will be destroyed. Uh, Jesus will return. The souls, the, the, the souls that are saved, will go to heaven. Everyone else goes to eternal perdition, including all the Jews, except those who have found. Uh, Jesus in time. Now, that's a massacre of Jews that goes way beyond what Hitler thought of. You know, that he wanted to get rid of them in Europe. This is, they'll all go to eternal perdition permanently. Can't get more anti Semitic than that. But you have to have the conflict which will lead to Armageddon. This is believed in very high places. Take George W. Bush, President Bush a dedicated evangelical Christian. When he was trying to convince France to join in the campaign against Iraq, the war in Iraq, he met with French President Chirac. They had a meeting in which Bush started talking to Chirac in ways which Chirac couldn't understand. Uh, he was talking about Gog and Magog coming from the north to attack Israel. And we have to stop Gog and Magog. Chirac's an educated European. He didn't know what he was talking about. What he was talking about was a passage in the book of Ezekiel in the Bible, which nobody understands. It has these names. Gog, Magog, nobody knows what they are. It's a little kind of uh, stories and inventions about them. And they came from the north. So for a long time, the evangelicals interpreted Gog and Magog as Russia. It's coming from the north to attack everything we love. Uh, Russia disappeared. Gog and Magog turned out to be Saddam Hussein. So what what Bush was telling Chirac is, we got to stop Saddam Hussein, Gog and Magog, straight out of the book of Ezekiel, but before he destroys Israel. But that's the leadership class in the United States, face it, and a large part of the population. Uh, the, uh, for Trump and Israel, his eye is on two things, rich Jewish donors like Adelson, and the voting bloc of evangelical Christians and other Christians. Well, one consequence of that is give Israel everything it wants. Okay, so in fact, yeah, sure, anything they want, we give it to them because it's going to help me get elected. Uh, this is actually what he's doing is taking what has been U.S. policy for a long time and turning it to an outlandish caricature of itself. And that's what he's doing on many areas. But as I said, neoliberalism, he, he didn't invent neoliberalism. He's just carrying it to an extreme outlandish version. And the same is true on every thing. Uh, uh, attacking China, you know, uh, whatever it may be, he's just taking it to an extreme. Well, part of it is US-Israeli policy. And here there's a background. Well, it goes back to the 1970s. In the 1970s, after the 1967 war, Israel had a choice, a definite choice. It, the documentary record on this is overwhelming. Well, they had the choice of integrating into the region as a peaceful, country accepting uh, its place through diplomacy and negotiations uh, to make it to be precise. They had the choice in the mid 1970s, I'm quoting now, of accepting uh, a Palestinian state 
on the international border with guarantees, I'm quoting, guarantees for the right of each state to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. Now that was coming from the UN Security Council, supported by Egypt, Syria, Jordan, most of the rest of the world. They could, and that's, not, that's just one document, plenty of others, it was vetoed by the United States. Okay, it came up again, vetoed. Uh, I won't run through the whole record, but that's the way it goes right to the present. And the last US veto, most US vetoes never even get mentioned. It's nobody's business if we vote veto everything. If China vetoes something, it's a headline, but the US does, we don't talk about it. One was actually uh, reported because it was so outlandish. This was under Obama, February 2011, 2011, yeah. There was a vote in the Security Council calling for implementation of official US policy, which is very weak. Official US policy said, don't expand the settlements any further. The issue is not expansion of the settlements, it's their existence but US policy is extremely weak. Don't expand them any further. Just be satisfied with the robbery you've got, you've taken. That was the Security Council resolution. Obama vetoed it because it was, would have been too critical of Israel. That made some reporting, but that's basically been the records from the seventies to the present. Uh, the reason why Israel can carry out its project of uh, creating a greater Israel that basically takes whatever it wants in the occupied territories. The reason is the US has backed it all the way. Trump, as I say, is carrying it to an outlandish, obscene level. Is that necessarily permanent? I don't think so. Public opinion in the United States is changing. It's quite striking that the strong support for Israel now is among evangelical Christians and the national, the ultra nationalist right. It's a big change from 10 or 15 years ago when Israel was the darling of the liberal left, which has now changed. Can't tolerate Israeli policies, especially young people more supportive of Palestinians than Israel. That could lead to a change in policy take work, but it can happen. And I think that's the hope for the Palestinians, along with strong international support. I mean, the international community, most of it opposes what Israel's doing. Not all, not Modi, not the Gulf dictatorships, not the reactionary international. They think it's fine. But uh, the Europe, uh, Africa, Latin America, they don't approve. So it, if it changes in the US as it could, maybe there's some way of going back to something like the words I just quoted from the Security Council in 1976. I think that's a possibility. Well, I, not with Trump around, that's for sure. Trump around's going to get much, you want to see how bad it is? Take a look at this morning's newspaper. It's a long story in the New York Times this morning about what's happening in the Jordan Valley. Incidentally, this is the kind of story which would never have appeared a couple of years ago. It reflects the changes in attitude and awareness. It's a very good story talking about how Israel is destroying Palestinian possibilities of agriculture in the Jordan Valley simply by stealing the water. The settlers go in, which is of course illegal. They dig deep wells, destroys the aquifer. They hook up to the Israeli water system, Makarot. They get plenty of water, a lot of uh, you know, irrigation, uh, Palestinian farms, which were flourishing. The story happens to be about the Jericho bananas, 
which are famous all throughout the middle east wonderful unique bananas they can't raise them anymore because israel steal the settlers are stealing all the water and the people who raise the bananas now work as laborers in the israeli settlers farms okay uh, that's a microcosm of what's happening in much of the world happening right there and interestingly today it is reported in the united states a couple of years ago it never been reported that's an indication of the changes in attitudes i'm talking about maybe this will break into people's minds it'll be possible to get out on the streets as you were talking before and do something about it so there are possibilities but a lot of work yeah i was thinking oh, i'm sorry i was thinking just before you go to the next point this is an opportunity also because we have been focusing on neoliberalism but what's striking is also what you outlined is linked specifically to neoconservatism as well and what's striking about neoconservatism because is because i mean we already know that trump is not only a race a racist but what's used as an excuse is a son-in-law but and certain jews who are in his administration but they are neoconservative jews and one of the things that's striking about neoconservatism all the way back from the writings of crystal through is not only it's anti-black racism but there's also this bizarre situation where neoconservatives as we see would rather be in a room with neo-nazis than to be in a room with progressives or black people or and many of the other indigenous peoples so i just wanted to add that in because of in addition to the evangelicals there is a situation of course as you mentioned there was an opportunity for a different israel but there is an israel right now that is formulating policies and people in the white house who are formulating policies that would just frankly make so many people so many of the victims of shoah holocaust as the expression goes turn over their grave would nobody could have imagined a day to see individuals in power who are jewish allying with neo nazis and i just wanted to at that point raise the question of neo conservatism yeah in fact i think the base for support for israel is evangelicals a lot of the christian community uh, and ultra nationalists among them the conservatives of course you know plenty in the jewish community but the young jewish community is moving away substantially that's absolutely absolutely yes in fact that's a big issue with jewish communities right now the younger jewish community is moved big, away from that big issue inside the jewish community the younger people are just drifting away they don't want to have part of this you know well uh, central and south america as long as trump is in we know what he's going to support the most reactionary elements in central and south america i mentioned bolsonaro uh okay in colombia uh, just pick him up one after the other that's just in his blood and he'll be supported by the international economic institution and the investor class in the united states and for them the model of the of the model the, the us model for central and south america was established in 1945 and hasn't changed since after the second world war the united states was of course the world dominant power it kind of laid out for every part of the world what its function was quite sophisticated for latin america if you, you want to see it it was established at in february 1945 at a, a, a hemispheric meeting that the united states called in mexico chapultepec mexico they established what they called an economic charter for the americas 
the economic charter for the Americas, as the State Department described it, said, we have to put an end to the new nationalism in Latin America. I'm virtually quoting. The new nationalism claims that the resources of a country should be used by the people of that country. We've got to put a stop to that. The resources of countries are, are to be used by the international investor community, which means us, okay? Secondarily others, but mainly us. Europe, uh, Europe Central America and Latin America are not supposed to undergo independent development of any kind, but only dependent development, which we will determine and which will be primarily in our interests in what is called euphemistically an open market, like the very powerful can compete and the very poor can compete. Uh, the nature of the open market, the liberal market, was described very well by Anatole France, French writer, maybe 100 years ago or so. He said, the open market means that the rich man and the poor man are both free to sleep under the bridge at night. That's the free market. So Central America and the United States can compete openly, uh, but everything, but the idea of using resources for your own purposes, that's out. That's the new nationalism, which we have to smash. Okay. That's, I'm afraid I've got a lot of anno rather annoyed canines here. I'll have to leave in a few minutes, but that's, uh, that's okay. Let me go. The, uh, they're quiet for a certain amount of time, but their patience is limited. It's one of the problems of working at home. <laughs> okay, I guess stay down. Uh, well, I won't run through the whole history, but especially Latin Americans are very familiar with this. It's been acted out over and over. Now, Trump is an extreme. Democrats are not all that different, but they're not that extreme. Under Democratic more liberal administrations, there are opportunities for activists here to change the nature of policy. Not under Trump, no influence of popular activism. And that makes a big difference. And I think that's where the, of course, there's plenty of internal things. I don't want to say that Latin Americans are agents on their own. They're not just reacting to the US, but it's a big, powerful force. It's, uh, as uh, could go on with that, there's plenty to say, but let me say something about uh, a lot of these questions had to do with sources of energy, motivation, is there hope, and so on. Uh, I think all of those things fall together. We basic, let me go back to one of my favorite philosophers, David Hume. He wrote a book called Principles of Government around the mid 18th century, first principles of government. The first paragraph of it uh, explains that as he puts it, power is in the hands of the governed, of those who are governed. In all societies, the only way the powerful maintain themselves is through consent, through obedience. They don't have the power their power is very fragile and can be taken away. But that requires that consent be withdrawn. And that is across the board. Militarism, neoliberalism, capitalism, uh, having a job, take having a job. We consider that a wonderful thing. Classical liberals didn't consider it a wonderful thing. They called it a horrible thing. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, the last of the classical liberal thinkers, the most important one in the United States, uh, Lincoln and his Republican Party regarded wage labor as no different from slavery, except that it was temporary till you could become a free person. 
that goes way back to classical greece and rome being dependent on another person for much of your life is an intolerable attack on human dignity and rights i think that's just below the surface people don't have to consent to that the working people in the late 19th century fought bitterly against it their slogan was that quoted those who work in the mills should own them manage them don't have to have bosses telling you what to do when you can take a bathroom break what clothes you have to wear you, know, you don't have to spend your waking life under those conditions of servility to a master uh, all of this depends on consent i think hume was correct but and there's you know as uh, marx pointed out the ruling ideas in any society are the ideas of the masters of production uh, but those are it's what gramsci called hegemonic common sense but that's thin that can be pulled apart and overcome now we see it happening all the time we see it happening on the streets of america right now uh, after the floyd murder uh, almost instantly a huge popular movement developed it, it grew out of a rise in consciousness the same kind of rise in consciousness that led to that new york article new york times article i mentioned opinions and attitudes are changing and something comes that's really striking like a brutal murder of yet another black blew up spread all over the country biggest social movement in american history black and white solidarity spread all over the world serious goals uh things really things to work on more popularity than martin luther king had at the peak of his popularity things like that are breaking out all over There's a lot of concern a lot of activism the climate strike re uh, was an, of young people was another example of others now that's where hope is that's where it's always been hope is in the people whose names we don't even know but who are on the forefront of getting things done they create the conditions under which more famous people get their names known always been true that's the source of hope now and it's a real source the other source is that we do recognition that we have the means to overcome the crises that face us domestically internationally globally so we can grasp those opportunities and that's a source of hope and that's all we have to think about and what i have to think about is leaving for free thank you professor chomsky uh for the audience there were people who were curious about iraq and other uh, questions, particularly in terms of economics, but we'll have to save that for another time. What I would like to thank you, I would like to thank our, uh, the Vice Chancellor and Director of GCAS, Kristen Davis, our Vice President, Asfar Hussain. And remember, everyone, that one of the, the not that your opinions, your actions matter, and what the current forces that are trying to get you to stay home and stay away are presuming is that your absence would be a tacit consent to their machinations. So we got to get out there and make it clear that we don't approve and fight for what we would need to have happen to ensure life and dignity and freedom on our planet. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Thank you, Professor Chomsky.